to that. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, it's good to see some of the familiar faces and faces I don't recognize as I come back to visit this morning. Um, just a little update on my summer. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering. Uh, I'm having a blast this summer. It's it's almost kind of gritting, wanting to come back to school. But I'm, I'm I know it's a it's a part of the, the whole thing. Uh, but I've been mowing and umpiring and staying busy and trying to find time to to breathe in there and to, to spend time with family. I know I was I was telling uh, Dorothy last night when I stopped in to visit with her that one of the most special things I've been able to do this summer is that every night, whether I mowed all day or had umpiring or just twiddle my thumbs all day is that every night I get to sit down and I get to watch the Reds game with my dad. And that's just something special that, that we love to do and it's something that we, we look forward to every day. So um, that's just been kind of a little bit of a highlight of my summer. Uh, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to be with you guys here this morning. I have a question for you. And it's a particular question. And it's something that I share from my own experience. And the question is, have you ever ran out of gas? See, this summer while I've been mowing, it seems like I run out of gas all the time. I'll be mowing in the middle of this yard and make a turn, and all of a sudden, putters down and I'm out of gas. So I have to go and get the gas can and fill it up. Or I have to load it back up on the trailer and stop at the gas station. It seems like I spend more and more and more time at the gas station filling up my truck, filling up my lawnmower, filling up my weed whacker, and all those different things. But it wasn't until last winter that I ran out of gas in my, my truck. I had never ran out of gas in a vehicle before until last winter. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about this morning, what was being laid on my heart, I thought that this story and the illustration that goes along with it was something that, that would be something special for us today. So the story goes that I was the, the day after winter break, Christmas break for us. We just finished the semester, and I was staying with, with Pastor Chambers and Marcy. And the next morning, I was going to get up, and I was going to go preach at Sherburnville Christian Church. Just go right over there in Sherburnville. Uh, I, think that, I think that's in Illinois, right? Illinois, Indiana? Either way. But I was going there to preach with the Preaching Ambassadors program. And so I woke up that morning, and I was getting ready, and Pastor Chambers and Marcy had already out the door, and I was getting my stuff together, and I lost track of time. And so I, I realized it, and I'm like, oh, no, i got to get going, because I'm, if not, I'm going to be late. So I get out to my car, and I turn the key, and the first thing that I see is low fuel. And I say, oh, no. So I'm looking at my GPS. I'm looking at my car. I'm looking at my GPS, and it dawns on me. If I stop for gas, I'll be late. And I don't like to be late. That's just not me. So I think, oh, I'm just going to have to make it. I, I'm going to have to make it. So I, I get there, and I'm driving along, and I'm thinking, I really hope I don't run out of gas here, because if I do, that'll be really embarrassing. Here I am going to preach at this church I've never been at before. It's the third Sunday in Christmas. It's Advent. I'm supposed to be joyful. And if I run out of gas, I am not going to be joyful. So I get there. Luckily, I made it. I made it to the church. And so I get there, the service is really good. We talked about joy, it was really great people, really good service. And I get in my car afterwards, turn the key, low fuel. And I'm like, all right, the first gas station that I see, I'm stopping. First gas station that I see. But might I remind you, I don't know if you're familiar with Sherbourneville. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea where I was. And so I was like, all right, I'm just gonna drive until I find a gas station. And when I do, I'll stop. And so I just start driving, I think it's on, whatever highway, state highway that was, and I get to Highway 41, and I still haven't found a gas station. And I said, okay, I know there's a gas station on this road, so I'm just going to head towards home, because I was going home after that, and I, so I'm, I'm cruising. Cruise, cruise control set at 70 miles an hour, just chilling. All of a sudden, it disengages. Cruise disengages, and I'm like, oh no, I just ran out of gas. What am I going to do? I'm going up and over this bend, and I get to the top of this little hill, and I start going down, and I see it. Marathon gas station. Right there. I said, okay, you can make it. You can make it. I'm cruising, just coasting. 70, 60, 50, 40. I turn my flashers on, and I'm just, just coasting on the highway. Pull over to the side, and 30, 20, 10. By then, I... I opened my door and I jumped out the door and I'm pushing along with it thinking I can make it. I'm a football field away. I can make it. I can make it. 
I keep going and I keep going. Luckily, somebody had stopped along the side of the road and helped me push it there, but I made it. I made it to the gas station. And then I, I opened my wallet and I realized that I don't have any money. <laughs> and I'm praying that they take credit card because if they don't, I'm in trouble. But they did. And so I filled up my tank and I made it home. You see, the fact is, is that I'd stretched my gas tank a little too far. And I, let me tell you, that's a very unsettling feeling when your car just all of a sudden just turns off while you're driving. You know, I thank God that marathon station was there because I don't know what I would have done if it wasn't there. And I also thank God for that pedestrian who stopped and didn't have to stop, but they helped me get it the rest of the way there. You see, sometimes I wonder if our spiritual lives don't ever pop up with low fuel. I wonder if our, our eternal flame within us ever seems to run low on gas. If, I wonder if we can ever, as Christians, run out of gas in our walk with Christ. So that's what I'm here to kind of talk about today. And what's, that's going to be our illustration that we work around this morning as we unpack the scripture and as we talk about how the disciples had to be cautious of that to make sure that they didn't run out of fuel in their walk with Christ. Because I think sometimes that can happen to us. I know in my own experience, there are times that when I am just on fire for God, and if there was a flame within me, it's a bonfire, and it's blazing up. But I also think there's times in my life that, you know, I reflect and that maybe my flame was just a little candle or a match. And when I, and I reflect on those, and I reflect on the times that it's burning as a bonfire, it makes me think that why isn't there a, 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 med, a me, medium, or why can't I just stay like that bonfire and be on fire all of the time? So this morning as we unpack this, reflect on your own eternal fire. See, the Old Testament talks a lot about fire. In Leviticus, when they're talking about preparing sacrifices, Leviticus 6.13, it says, Fire is to be kept burning continually on the altar. It is to not go out. And in the 26th proverb, it says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisper, contention quiets down. You see, just like a car, just like a vehicle, there needs to be a stimulant within that fire. There needs to be something that is constantly kindling that fire, constantly building that up. And for our spiritual fire and our spiritual flame, there is much of the same thing. We need to constantly be building and working on that flame within us, strengthening our relationship with Christ. See, when Jesus walked the earth, he never really had to worry about that flame going out because he was perfect in every way. But the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples that followed him around, they were just humans like us. And so Jesus, as he walked and as he went from place to place, he constantly made sure that his disciples didn't run out of fuel. They didn't run out of gas. That their relationship and their fire within them was a continual blaze. That they were on fire for God. See, I always wonder sometimes what it would have been like to be a disciple, what the twelve would have went through, what they would have experienced as they followed Jesus, as they walked from town to town to place to place and experienced the miracles that Jesus did. And as they did the work that Christ had commanded them, you know, it would have been a lot to follow Jesus around. See, this is a time before cell phones, before cars, before even memory phones. So every night when they would get a chance to rest, if they did get a chance to rest, I imagine, you know, the disciples just sleeping wherever they could, getting a chance to rest. See, our passage of Scripture for today is not from 3 John, like Pastor Chambers might have said last week. It's actually from Mark chapter 6, verses 30. And this, this is the passage that directly kind of follows Jesus sending out his disciples. So before we get a chance to read that, I want to talk a little bit about what happens in chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is already becoming known, is already on the move, performing miracles and healing those who are sick. 
And starting in verse 6, Jesus prepares to send out his disciples. He is sending them out to do the work that he's been doing. He sends them out to do the miracles that he has been doing. In verse 6, it starts by saying that he commands them and gives them authority over evil spirits to heal those and to rid those people of evil spirits, to heal those who are in need. To do, to go off on their own for a little bit, to journey out to lands, to different towns and villages. And he sends them out by themselves, two by two, to do the work that he has commanded them to do. And then it, it, there's a break kind of in the story in which Mark talks about John the Baptist and talks about his struggle to recognize Christ as the one who is to come. And then we have kind of our passage, but in the midst of our passage are two of the most well-known miracles that Jesus performed. Besides, of course, the resurrection, Follows, following our passage is Jesus feeds the 5,000 and Jesus walks on water. Two miracles that, if you were to mention one of them, people would probably say, oh yeah, Jesus walked on water, right? That's why it's super cool when you walk on ice, because it's like you're walking on water, but you're not. But anyways, so in the midst of this, this one little excerpt that we're going to talk about today is these two miracles that when we look back and kind of, if we can take our minds off of just the miracles and look at what's happening and the nitty gritty of these stories and what Jesus is really emphasizing to his disciples, I think we can better check ourselves and make sure that in our Christian walks, we don't ever run out of fuel, that we don't ever run low on fuel. So if you'd like to read along with me today, I'll be reading from from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34, just a few verses. So let's, let us read. It says, Then the apostles gathered around Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he, being Jesus, said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them recognized them and ran on foot to all the towns to get ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So here in this just short little excerpt, this short little passage, this, this prerequisite to the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus and his disciples are all kind of just, I imagine them gathered around in a little circle, around a campfire. And they're there, and they're sharing all the great things that they had done. All the, all the people that they had healed, and all of, the, all of the people that they had brought to Christ. The, the people who did not know Christ, that they had introduced to Christ. See, I imagine that they're just sharing, and they're, they're in such celebration of all the people who they had the opportunity to share Christ with. Verse 30, or yeah, verse 30 says, And they reported all they had done and taught. Do we ever, do we ever wonder, do we ever get a chance to just sit down and share all that we had done and all, all that we have taught, to reflect back, to be in that moment when our fire is burning really high and we're sharing and we're sharing, and we're feeling that we're celebrating all that we had done and taught. But Jesus, knowing their feeling and knowing how they have been doing, he immediately recognizes. And the next verse kind of pre-tells this when he says, But then because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. To eat. So the disciples who had just gotten back from being out on their own two by two and sharing with all the people and healing and bringing people to Christ, they were so out there and so burning on full flame that they'd forgotten to eat. They'd forgotten to do very the minimal necessity of eating. They'd forgotten to stop and refuel. They had forgotten to make a time to rest. So Jesus knows that, and he 
invites them to go to a quiet place. Has that ever happened to you before? I know, I know it doesn't look like it, but that really happens to me all the time, to where I'll be just getting so busy. I'll be working on something. I'll want to finish this yard. I'll start another yard. I'll be working on a task. I'll jump to another task. That all of a sudden, I look down at the clock or look at my phone, and I realize that it's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I haven't ate anything the entire day. And I'm like, I should probably eat something. But the fact is, is that happens to us. Whether you'd like to admit it or not, we get so focused on one thing. We get so busy doing something we think we need to do that we neglect resting. We neglect doing something as simple as just taking the time to be in the quiet of our own thoughts, to enjoy the quiet of our own thoughts. We neglect that. And I think sometimes it's, it's hard to do in this, in this world that we live in that it constantly says you have to do something, you have to be doing something to be successful, that if you just sit around and you don't do anything, then you're just kind of being a, a bug on the wall. But in all reality, I mean, D- David brought up a really good point this morning in Sunday school when he talked about, talked about Jacob wrestling with God. That something that is very important for us is that when Jacob sends out his family to cross the river, that he is there alone. And I think this is something that even Jesus does a lot when he takes time to just rest and be with his father. That When I was in a spiritual disciplines class, we talked a lot about solitude. And solitude is, is a great discipline. And I never really thought, you know, this is something you need to do. But it's, it's something that really, if you just rest in the presence of God, and that's what, that's what Jesus is reminding his disciples of. He's saying, you guys are so busy. You guys were just out by your own doing all the great works. I know I'm celebrating with you. But listen, if you keep doing this, your flame is going to go out. If you keep doing this, you can't keep up. We have to take the time to rest. We have to take the time to be in a quiet place and rest with our Heavenly Father. We have to take the time to do those things so that our fire doesn't get dim like a candle. So Jesus recognizes that. And he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me to a quiet place. So they gather on a boat and they go across. And I imagine that they're just resting after being out Now they're all back together, and they're they're resting together. They're resting quietly in solitude. They're taking this time to refuel, to revamp, to self-reflect, to be in solitude, to listen for that whisper, the Holy Spirit guiding them. I guess the Holy Spirit wasn't really there yet. But listening for their Father and being with them in solitude and resting. You know, I think sometimes for us, we need to find that quiet place. We need to find that place in which we can go and, and turn off our cell phone and be distraction-free and just rest. I know that for, for one, of the, the, one of my classes, the disciplines that I was for solitude is that every night or so, right around when I was either starting to work on my homework or right kind of in the middle, is I would set aside time, and I really wish I would do this more, but I, I'm the same way. When, I, when I, I share this with you, I'm the same way that I just want to do and do and do and do. And it's easy to run out of fuel. But I would set aside a time every night and go to Kelly Prayer Chapel. And I would just, just lay there. And I would just turn off my phone and just be in the presence to rest. To take that opportunity to put off all my school, put off all that stuff, and just rest. To just be in the presence. To be present with God. And Jesus knows that his disciples need to do that. And I think we all are in need sometimes to just rest with Christ. So they do that. Jesus says, come and and." We'll find you a quiet place to rest. But what happens? What happens directly after that? When they get across the, the body of water, when they get out of the boat, 
Who's waiting for there, there for them? Is it a giant memory foam pillow with a nice rest for them to take a break? Or is it 5,000 people who are desperately thirsting for Christ, who have heard about this Christ and want to be there with him? So in the midst of this in this story, and Jesus feeds 5,000 people, they just were reminded to take a break, to take a rest in Christ. Take a rest for a moment. But then they get to the other side of the, of the body of water, and there is 5,000 people. There is what some would con- conclude to be almost chaos of people just, just thriving to want to see Jesus, thriving to want to see who this man who they called Jesus was. And so Jesus, like always, shows compassion to them. And he shows compassion and begins to start teaching them all the different things. And then we see that he goes on to feed them. He makes the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And not long after that, when everyone is fed, Jesus reminds his disciples again. He says, go, get on this boat ahead of me and take some time to rest before our next, our next place that we're going to. And so Jesus sends his disciples out again. It says, verse 45 of chapter 6, says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him. And while he dismissed the crowd after leaving, he went up to the mountainside to pray. See, immediately Jesus recognizes that his disciples just had to contribute into the feeding of the 5,000, and he he says, get in this boat and go and rest again before our next thing. And then he himself dismisses the people and goes to the mountainside to pray. See, this is something that Jesus often does throughout the Gospels, is that he often just goes to a mountainside or, or goes off by himself and, and just has some time with his Heavenly Father that he, that he gets the opportunity to just rest in his own Father, rest in his own presence. And when Christ sends his disciples across immediately, sending them off again to rest, he's again reminding us of how we need to rest, of how when our world seems like it's chaos of of 5,000 people who are in desperate need of being fed, or when our list of things to do is longer than our time of relaxation. It's reminding us that we need to rest and refuel in Christ. See, in the midst of this miracles, in the midst of miracles, Jesus calls his disciples to rest. And in the midst of our crazy and busy world in which it's an ever-turning climb to get to the top, in which we are continually trying to keep up, with what the world wants us to do, Christ calls us to rest. Christ calls us to take time within our busy day, to take time within what it is that we think we need to do to rest and be with our Father. See, I don't know who said it, but the quote kind of just came to my mind. is that I have so much to do today that if I don't spend three hours with my Father, with my Heavenly Father, then there's no way I'm going to be able to get all of it done. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, it doesn't make any sense. I "I have so much to do today that if I just took those three hours and I put it towards the stuff I needed to do, then I'd maybe be able to get it done. But in in all actuality, what this, this quote is saying is that if we have so much to do today, that if I rely on my own, Ability. If I rely on my own abilities, and rather than putting aside time to rest and trust in God, then there's no way I'm going to be able to accomplish it. But if I set aside that time, and I rest, and I refuel, and I revamp, then with God, it'll be like nothing. So with God, all things are possible. And so when I thought of that, and I think of that, and I think of our own walk, 
I think of the times in which I set aside time to rest. And I think about all the stuff that I think that I need to get done. And I reflect on how it is that I am resting, how it is that I'm refueling. You see, in the Matthew's telling of this story, he shares with us in chapter 11 of the same story, he sends out the five or sends out the disciples. Towards the end of it, he, he shares with us in verse 28 of chapter 11. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart. And in you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus knows that we are human. And when we walk as Christ walked, we have to be reminded. And he reminds his disciples, and he's reminding us today, that we need to rest in him. We need to take time to rest because we are weary and burdened. We have times in our, in our walk in which our flame, our eternal flame within us, is that candle, is that match. And we are weary and, and burdened. But he calls us and he says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I, 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 reading this verse, I mean, of course, when I first read this, I thought my yoke, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what, what's, because a yoke is in the middle of an egg. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, it's going to be easy. It's just a little inside of an egg. And then once you read it and you realize what, he, what the, the scripture is talking about here, he's not talking about the inside of an egg. He's talking about a harness or a, a connector between two oxen. That which, when one, when one pulled, they, they, they would pull together. And so when Christ says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he's not saying that, the inside of an egg is easy. He's saying that if you rest in me and if you follow me, then we can do this together. So you don't have to do it by yourself. We don't have to, to, to set aside that time to do it ourselves. But he's saying if you rest in me and trust in me, that when we pull together, we will move along together. Our relationship will go along together because we trust in each other and because Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. See, I think sometimes we get wore out. We have times in which our flame is, is burnt out. Not that it ever burns out. But we feel like we're weary and burdened. And so this morning, I don't know if, if you feel weary or burdened. I don't know if you feel like you're just came from a bonfire and you are absolutely on fire. But the fact still remains is that within us there's a fire. There's Within us there's a flame. And when I thought about this and something that I constantly remind myself is I remind myself of the eternal flame at all of that. I don't know if you, you know of that flame or know where that is, but it's, it's just a flame that continually burns, continually is ablaze, whether it's windy, it's raining, it's snowy, it's a constant reminder of the persistency that our relationship with Christ takes. It's a constant reminder of the fire within us, the Holy Spirit who rained down on us and continually kindles that fire. So when we, every morning, wake up, we can put wood on that fire. We can pour gas on that fire. We can do what we can to better our relationship with Christ. We can do what we can to be on fire for Christ. But we know that, that our yoke is easy and that Christ is pulling alongside us, thriving and wanting our relationship with Christ, with Him, to burn continually. So this morning, like I said, I don't know whether you are burning like a bonfire and you are on fire for Christ, or whether you feel that maybe you are burning like a candle. 
But my hope is, is that each and every person in this room and each and every person viewing online or every person that hears this would know that, that we have a fire within us. If we call ourselves a Christian and we have a fire within us that we are called to, to, to keep burning. And that that is how people in the world know us. That when I'm walking through the store, when I'm walking on campus, that, that people should be able to say, no, that person's a little different. And then they should be able to see the fire within us that, that drives us. So today, my prayer is, is that people would see us and know that we are on fire. That maybe if you feel weary and burdened, or maybe if you feel that you're on fire, that you would keep that fire. Or if you feel that you're long away and weary and burdened, that you would call out to him and say, Ignite, reignite that flame within me. Help it to burn steadily. And then we would leave here today more on fire for Christ than we came in this morning. That's my prayer, is that we would be able to leave here today more on fire in our relationship than when we came in this morning. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful day you've given us. We give you thanks for your Son and his words that calls us to come and rest in you, Lord. We thank you for this, this building and this place and these people who've come to worship your name. And Lord, I don't know the, the circumstance of every person here, but, but it is my prayer that we all have a fire ablaze within us. And that we each know our relationship with you so that when we reflect on our own life, we know our own flame. And Lord, help us to remember today that we need to rest in you. Help us to remember that, that our fire is how people in the outside world know us. That if we're not burning like a bonfire, then the tempter is coming in. Lord, help us today to leave here more ablaze and more on fire for you than when we came in. Help us to feel your presence and reignite that flame today. Be with us as we leave this place that people would see our flame and know us as followers of you. We love you, Lord. And in all of this, we give you thanks and the glory. In Jesus' name we do pray.